Let's imagine that we get to start a new country and in that new country we have a new system. And let's say this system is everybody in the country has a name but in addition to a name they have a number. These numbers will be different. Some numbers will be low numbers like 1, 2 and 3. Some numbers will be middle range numbers like 2 or 300. And some numbers will be huge, 1000 or 10,000. Most people will have the low numbers, a few people will have the mid-range numbers, and very few people will have the high numbers. Let's imagine then these numbers denote your status in society, but not just your status, your worth in society. But this worth doesn't come from any actual real worth, not how important you are, but from who your parents are, what your family name is, what job your parents did. How much money you have in the family. Let's imagine this number then told you how much rights you have in society. How much you could own. What job you could do. Who you could marry. But also how you had to treat each other. You had to bow very low when you meet people with a lot higher number. But people with a lower number have to bow to you. Also how much influence you have. Such as in a court case, if you have a low number and someone else has a high number, their word counts more than your word, even if you're telling the truth. Nope, you're the liar because you have a lower number. Let's imagine we run this country this way for 600 years. What would be the end result? Would it be a successful country or a failed country? Would it be a country with lots of human rights or bad human rights? Would it be a country that you wanted to live in or even go on holiday in? Would it be a country with lots of political unrest or lots of stability? Well, you don't actually have to imagine all this because this isn't science fiction. This is true. There was a country in the world that ran a system like this for 600 years. And in this video, I'm going to tell you the story of that country. Almost 10 years ago, I wrote this article for a travel magazine and website in Thailand. No substantial English writing existed on the subject of Sakdina. In researching the article, the longest I could find was one paragraph long. Also, no real substantial writing existed in the Thai language either. So, in researching the article, I relied almost entirely on PhD theses written by Thai students as being the only source of information on the subject. Since then, the article has been republished and used a few times. It appeared in a Thai newspaper and as far as I know, it's still the only substantial piece of writing in the English language on the subject of Sakdina. So here is the article. One of the pleasures you get from visiting Thailand is the sense of the old. The various protocols and traditions from an age gone by that Thailand still enigmatically clings to in the shadow of the postmodern skyline. Seen by tourists, the girls that stand at the doors to restaurants and shops simply pay to bow to customers as they enter are something old worldly. To a local, they are nothing strange, simply basic politeness. Many visitors are left wondering how within a country where anyone can don a suit and stroll through Siam Paragon, how every Thai seems to innately know their place within an almost Victorian class system of deference and aloofness. When a tourist puts his first tentative step on terra firma and for every moment henceforth, unwittingly he is immersing himself in the translucent ether of Sakdina and he will probably never become aware of this fact. Sakdina harks back to the dawn of Thailand and in the 21st century has called on its adaptability to survive. 21st century Sakdina can be seen in many things. The amount of privilege a person deserves. Seeing an expensive car drive by with a police escort, leading it rudely gesturing to ordinary drivers to get out the way. The deference shown by a servant to his master or students lowering their heads when they pass a teacher in a corridor. Sakdina is the division of society into commoners and higher castes. 
and the realization that a tuk-tuk driver, even if he saved his pennies and passed that degree at Ramkamhang Open University, he would never be accepted in a job vacancy for a government officer, simply because of his low birth. Sakdina's origins lie deep in Thai history. Medieval Thailand was a sparsely populated land, remote regions separated by dense forests. Many isolated villages were only accessible by river. For the fledgling Ayutthaya kingdom sprawling across the center of this domain, maintaining control over remote possessions and provinces was a constant challenge. The regional lords that ruled over them often enjoyed far too much autonomy in the eyes of the greedy capital. It was in the reign of King Boromaracha Tirat, 1448-1488, known as King Trelok by Thais, that a formalized system was introduced designed to force even the most far-flung regions into line. King Trelok passed a series of laws that have resonated down Thai history through to today and are probably the most influential royal commands issued in Thai history. Trelok introduced a governmental system, which nowadays is known as the Sakdina system, but at the time it was known as the laws of civil, military and provincial hierarchies. The system itself was based upon a cultural and social order that had been practiced in much of the country for centuries before, but at local level. Trelok made three important changes to this system. He expanded it, he standardized it, and he centralized it. Thai society had long been divided into two classes, the nobles and the masses. What the Sakdina system did, it clearly defined the roles within society of these two classes, how they would interact with each other, and how they would interact amongst themselves, creating a strict social order based on the quantified worth of each individual. Rigid castes were formalized within the ranks of both the nobles and the commoners. When it was first introduced, Sakdina was mainly a system of social interaction. The worth of an individual determined how he should responsibly behave and the respect he was due from others. Today the Thai language is much simplified from the past. However, the use of pronouns is still important. In the past, there were an enormous amount of pronouns. There was ways for saying I when you talk to a slave. There was ways of saying I when you talk to a king. There was ways of saying I to someone who was higher status than you. There was ways of saying I when you were talking to someone even higher status to you. And similarly, ways of saying I when you're talking to someone slightly lower status than you and very much lower status than you. But these eyes were not the same for everyone. Someone of low status would have one group of eyes, someone of middle status would have a completely different set, and someone of high status would have a completely different set. It was a complex system, and when you add yous and he's and she's and them into it, in Thailand in the past it was enormously complicated with an awful lot of protocol to talk to someone, and you had to use virtually different language systems. In the late 1990s, the king of Thailand authored a book based on the Hindu legend, the Ramayana. He wrote it in royal language. That is the language you are supposed to use when you are talking to the royalty of Thailand. The language was so different from the existing Thai language that absolutely nobody in Thailand could actually read or understand the book. In fact, the only people who would have been able to understand it were the royal servants who had to actually use this language when talking to the king. Also, ties bowed, and how high or how low you should bow when meeting another person was very important. The problem with this was if you're having such a rigid system, knowing your status in comparison to someone else's status was very important. Giving everybody a number then provided a clear indication of your status compared to someone else so you knew how to treat them and you know how high or how low you had to bow. Sakdina also spelled out your responsibility as a person. People of noble birth or high Sakdina were expected to live by higher standards than people of low birth or of low Sakdina. The system of Sakdina then was largely created 
to create a system of cordiality and social stability. However, any system based on privilege can be used for personal gain and corruption. And this quickly began to happen with Sakdina. One such area was the area of crime, where people could use their higher Sakdina to get weaker sentences when committing crimes against people of low Sakdina and vice versa, people of low Sakdina would be given strong sentences when committing crime against people of high Sakdina. Another area that Sakdina could be used was that people of high Sakdina could gain audiences with the king and get granted royal favor to give them advantages over other people. How Sakdina actually worked is almost like something out of a science fiction novel. Dividing the country up into ranks is one thing, but how do you quantify it? With Sakdina, every single person in the country was assigned a numerical rank according to their worth. What defined these ranks tended with commoners to be their job. A job having a recognized level of Sakdina associated with it represented by a number. With the nobles, it tended to reverse. Nobles were given numbers according to their rank, and then that number on the rank determined what job they could do. Such as to be a general requires you to already have a certain social rank and Sakdina number to get that position. Numbers were semi set in stone. In fact, there was only one way of changing the number. That was the king himself. With the king the sole person capable of promoting you or demoting you, this effectively centralized authority of Thailand in the hands of one man, which is what the Sakdina system was designed to do. The theory being monarchs would raise the Sakdina of people who were loyal to them and lower the Sakdina of people who were disloyal to them. This obviously didn't always play out as royalty was influenced by favorites and was subject to manipulation. The word Sakdina itself literally translates to field, na, and power, Sakdi. So effectively, Sakdi, na, field power, and is often referred to in Thai literature as Thai feudalism. One part of Sakdina is the land rights associated with it. The number rank each person in the country received through the Sakdina system was referred to as Rai. Rai is also a land measurement in Thailand of similar size to an acre. Many Thai sources suggest along with a Sakdina rank, a person was also given one Rai of land. So a government officer with a Sakdina or Rai of 225 would not only have the social standing 225, but would be granted 225 Rai of land by the king. If we look at some of these Sakdina ranks, the king of Thailand Sakdina was infinite as he owned the entire country as a personal possession. He could then distribute the land among his subjects. The crown prince of Thailand Sakdina ranking was a hundred thousand Rai, so he would have a hundred thousand acres of land. Members of the royal family had different amounts of rye, up to a maximum of 50,000 rye. Noble ranks, depending on how noble they were, there are five tiers of nobility in Thailand, had anything between 400 and 10,000. Government officials received anything between 50 and 400 rye. A craftsman would have 50 rai. Commoners tended to have 25 rai and slaves 5 rai. Women of non-noble birth had no rai at all and neither did Chinese. Meaning a Thai slave actually had higher status in Thailand than a very wealthy Chinese merchant. A point that goes a long way to understanding the mentality of modern day Thailand. Interestingly, another group had no rye whatsoever, or no social rank, and that was Buddhist monks. And Buddhist monks have the highest status in Thailand and are above the king theoretically. So they would be treated with the highest respect of anyone in Thailand, but actually have the lowest rye rank, which shows some ambiguity within the system. Whether there was ever a land distribution or not along with Rai is a highly debated subject. There may have been 
an initial when the system was created land distribution but it seems to be quite difficult to do when the system's up and running especially if you have a growing population where would the land come from to give this new population also what if you wanted to promote lots and lots of people you would seemingly have to demote lots and lots of people to get the land to give to them it is possible that new conquests could account for some of the land and also the king could have held land back in reserve but these would only be short-term solutions it doesn't seem like our land distribution could really have been maintained in the long term in fact evidence that it wasn't maintained in the long term can be found when a total rai held by people in a province of Thailand totaled 30,000 yet there was only 10,000 rai of land in that province. This seems to show that the rai was actually symbolic rather than actual ownership of the fields. From the 16th century onwards however there was definitely no land distribution associated with a rye number because a large percentage of the population were given rye for the first time these being monks chinese merchants and common women who were married leaving only chinese laborers and unmarried common women without rye I said before that the system was semi set in stone and the only way of changing your rye number was if the king increased or decreased your sack dina. This isn't entirely true. There was another system of doing that and this was by marriage. Ideally a man and a woman of identical or very similar rye would marry each other because there's little point in marrying someone of much lower rye than you. Marrying someone of much higher rye than you is desirable but they most likely won't desire you. The Sakdina system was designed to force people to marry within their social rank, thus keeping the stability of the country. However, ideas and social reality often don't match. A common woman only received Rai when she got married. She received it on two factors. The first factor is what wife she was, whether she was the first wife, the second wife and the third wife, also on what the man she was marrying Rai was. Women's Rai was also dependent on their husband. If their husband's Rai got promoted by the king, their Rai went up. If the husband's Rai was demoted by the king, their Rai went down. For noble women who already had Rai, the system was much more simple. If she married a man of higher Rai, her Rai was increased to his level of Rai. However, if she married a man of lower Rai, her Rai was lowered to the level of the man she married. For a noble man, there was no point in marrying a woman of higher status because it didn't increase his rye, or if he married a woman of lower status, it didn't decrease his rye. However, for a common man, if a common man married a woman of common status, she got her rye through him and she had no rye to begin with, so it would make no change for him. But if a common man married a woman of noble status who had much higher rye than him, he would actually be promoted to her level of rye. So it would be very desirable to a common man to marry a woman of noble status and this was one way of social climbing. One final way of increasing social status was if the daughter of a commoner married a noble. Not only would she gain rye through that marriage but her father would also increase his rye by marrying his daughter to a noble which meant there was great potential that if a commoner had a very very beautiful daughter he would seek a noble marriage for her in full knowledge he would gain rye but also a noble man doesn't lose rye by marrying below him so the Sakdina system created a lot of shenanigans when it came to marrying in ancient Thailand Unlike in the West though, Thai feudalism didn't die out but grew stronger as the years went by. In the reign of King Chulaluk, 1782-1809, a legal system called the Three Sealed Code was introduced in Thailand and it was based entirely on the Sak Dinar system. Basically, the testimony of a person of high rai describing a crime will carry much more weight than a person of low rai describing a crime. So if you had 
two conflicting witnesses in a court case, the court would believe the one with the highest rye. Similarly, if a person was convicted of committing a crime and they had very low rye and the person they committed the crime against had a very high rye, they would now quite legally would get a very stiff sentence. Meanwhile, if a person of a very high rye committed crime against someone of low rye, they would get a very light sentence. The system effectively meant that the powerful became untouchable because if a poor person prosecuted a rich person in court, not only were they going to get that rich person a very light sentence, but all of their friends and witnesses would be of low status and all of the rich person's friends and witnesses would be of high status, so the court would believe the rich person's friend's testimony. Vice versa, if a rich person or a person of high Sakdina brought a case against a poor person, they were almost 100% guaranteed to win and that poor person would get a very stiff sentence. Effectively gave the people of high Sakdina, the nobles and the wealthy, license to do anything they liked against the poor. By the reign of King Chulalongkorn, Thailand started to introduce the capitalist system. Thailand had an uneasy history of capitalism, adopting it, abandoning it, adopting it, abandoning it, and it only really became enamoured with it since around the 1980s. Capitalism, by rights, should have destroyed the Sakdina system. The Sakdina system was a system of social stability. Capitalism is a system of fluidity. Sakdina is about stopping competitiveness and keeping everything the same. Capitalism is about encouraging competitiveness and change. Sakdina is about maintaining the social order, no matter how incompetent the people at the top are. Capitalism is about people through competence struggling their way up from the bottom to the top. But most of all, Sakdina is a system that regards business as exceptionally low class. Initially, Chinese merchants, the only real merchants in Thailand, were given zero Sakdina ratings, and only later did they get Sakdina ratings, but they were enormously low. Thais regarded jobs of worth as such as the military serving in the government or education. Jobs that serve the people are the jobs of high worth, including rice farmers who grow the food for the people. They regarded jobs such as being a merchant based around selfishness, therefore of low value. It was only around the second half of the 20th century that the job businessman in Thailand started to become respectable. In the 1950s, when Thailand had a problem with communist guerrillas in the jungle, the Thai government responded by propagandizing all of the villages in the northeast with posters which read against communism, against capitalism. However, Sakdin was able to survive, maintaining an uneasy relationship with the capitalist system, but still able to exist alongside it. In fact, it was more capitalism that evolved and changed to accommodate Sakdina rather than the vice versa. Sakdina being a system of no social mobility, capitalism had to change into a system of zero mobility. This is achieved by things like systems of closed business circles where companies of high-ranking ties with lots of Sakdina will only do real business with other ties of high-ranking Sakdina. Sakdina was, was legally abolished as late as 1932 by the government that launched a coup against the king and ended royal power. Soon after, the fascist dictator Pibun Songkran, Thailand's most powerful ruler, in its entire history had a shot at ending the cultural legacy of Sakdina, but failed. Discovering almost 800 years of deference and effeteness doesn't go away very quickly, especially not in Thailand. There's a saying, understand Sakdina and you understand Thailand. In present day Thailand, in politics, Sakdina sets the relationship between the Thai government and its people. At least in theory, in the Western idea of civil democracy, a civil service and a government is representing and serving the people. In Thailand, this isn't true. In Thailand, the government considers themselves rightful leaders and the public something to be governed by them. 
and the people owing the government obedience and not criticism. In fact, the Sakdina system is strong in politics where the belief that people of higher Sakdina should not be criticized by people of lower Sakdina. This creates a passive acceptance of authority throughout Thailand, no matter how unjust and how corrupt, which is why Thai governments tend to be so bad. Sakdina can be seen in Thailand to this day simply by scanning recent news stories. In 2012, the heir to the Red Bull Empire hit a policeman on a motorcycle whilst driving drunk in his Ferrari at at least two times the speed limit, killing him. Five years later, still hasn't been questioned by the police, let alone arrested. In most countries, killing a policeman would generally be seen as a quite bad thing. But in Thailand, if a person of incredibly high Sakdina, like the heir to one of the largest fortunes in the country, kills a lowly police officer, it really isn't a problem. Meanwhile, an elderly couple, Udom and Dang, were given 30 years in prison for picking mushrooms in a national park. This sentence was considered unbelievable to the world, but is very explainable by the Sakdina system, in that the king of Thailand, who has infinite Sakdina, technically owns all national parks. And Budom and Dang were at the bottom of society. They were elderly couple and they were so poor they had to forage in forests just to feed themselves. It was effectively the people with the lowest possible rank of Sakdina committing a crime against the person with the highest. Therefore, they must receive the harshest sentence. They actually pled guilty and got their sentence reduced from 30 years to 15 years. After a major international outcry, they still only got their sentence reduced to five years simply for picking enough mushrooms to make one mushroom soup. In Thailand, a rich person can kill a policeman in cold blood and not so much as face a day in jail, but a poor person can pick a mushroom and go to jail for anything up to 30 years. That is Sakdina, and that is also the Three Seal Code, still in action, even though Sakdina has actually been abolished. Sakdina also emerged again in the recent troubles in Thailand, when Thai society so publicly divided into two factions, the poor farmer red shirt movement and the wealthy urban elite yellow shirt movement. The poor farmers being numerically superior and getting control of the government and the yellow shirts asking the military for a coup. The yellow shirts argument being that the electoral system needs to be changed and based upon some people's votes counting more or less, such as an educated middle class Bangkokers vote counting double and a peasant farmer's vote counting half or a quarter. Again, this is the Sak Dinar system in the Thai mentality. One of the most unique, interesting and unusual ways a country has ever run itself. I hope you've enjoyed this little video. If you have, please hit the like button and comment. I'll be back soon with some more really, really obscure historical videos. Thank you.